Hello and welcome to a DFS preview for the 2023 Wells Fargo Championship. My name is Eric and here's who's by DFS. It's all about trying to hit the optimal lineup every single week. Of course, that means taking a look at the bucket system, which helps us target the stats we want to build our lineups around. If you want to learn more about the bucket system, I have a video link in the description below. Go check it out. Not only are we going to be talking about the bucket system, but we'll also talk about the course and tournament information. We'll go over past optimal and GPP winning lineups. We'll also review the Mexico Open just to show you how well the buckets did, because then we'll segment into the buckets to give you, you know, pretty pretty good confidence in the whole sweet spot process for this week or heading into this week, I should say. So that is what we'll be covering in the preview. Before we start any of that, I want to remind you guys, there's a cheat sheet available. So everything I'll be talking about in this video, you can go check out uh, in the description. There's a link to this cheat sheet let me open something up i just noticed something there are two grasses we're using this week and i'll talk about that in the course information but the cheat sheet's available to you so everything that i go over in the preview video and my strategy videos out tomorrow i should say i go live tuesday nights at 7 p.m central standard time um all of this is available to you so whether or not you want to follow along with me while watching these on replay or while i'm live tomorrow during the tuesday video again this is available to you Check the link in the description below. You can use the filters that are currently on the cheat sheet. But if you wanted to use this data to your own, you know, copy it down or anything like that, make a copy of the actual spreadsheet. So you just go up to the file menu, scroll down four spots, and you'll see make a copy. That way it's yours. You can do whatever you want to it. You can add any anything to the cheat sheet that you find important. So again, this is all available to you. Find the link in the description. I'll also have an optimizer tomorrow. Um, I don't have one available right now. I usually wait until this information right here is populated. That is your, uh, your tea time information. So once I get that, I will have an optimizer ready for tomorrow. So if you want that, I will provide it. So those are the two things just to start the video off. Let's go into actual giveaways. Uh, if you didn't already know, here, let me, let me bring this down. I have a subscriber giveaway that I call it. There's a monthly giveaway as well as a weekly giveaway. I usually run the monthly giveaway during the first Monday of the new month. Guess what? It's May 1st. It's a Monday. We're doing a monthly giveaway. So this is for the month of April. Now, in order for us to give away the $50 you see on the screen, we got to hit the sub goal all the way over there to the left, which was 550 subscribers this month. We didn't hit it, unfortunately, but we did get a hearty number. I mean, I think I got 20 new subscribers, so I got I have nothing to complain about that. That's that's awesome. I appreciate all of those that did subscribe. That goal will be ongoing to the next month, so don't think anything was lost or anything was really failed. We'll do that going to the next uh, the next month. However, for this month, since we didn't reach the goal, we're not giving away the 50 bucks. Instead, we're giving a t-shirt away that has the sweet spot DFS logo on it. So whoever wins the monthly giveaway is going to get that. This also plays into our weekly giveaways. So what you see on the screen right there, be subscribed, comment down below. Those are ways to participate on this channel. Uh, actually, you had to do both of those things in order to participate on the channel and you'll get entries into each well, basically, you get one free entry per video you comment on. I usually put out about four to six videos every single week. So you can get up to four to six different entries every single week that go towards, again, the monthly giveaway you see on the screen, as well as the weekly giveaway. So I guess without further ado, let's run this thing. First thing we're going to do is the weekly subscriber giveaway. So I had 30 unique entries. It was the Mexico Open. A lot of people took it off. So not as high as we've seen in the past, but still a pretty good number. Uh, and just to scroll down, these are all the videos I have. The preview, the Zurich uh, classic review video, the tournament information, all that good stuff. So hitting Y means we get our winner. Gabriel Brown. Hey, Gabe. Congratulations. Can't remember where to send the money, but you and I will keep in touch or I'll, I'll uh, contact you and we'll figure it out. Gabriel wins $5. That was the weekly subscriber giveaway. Sorry if I didn't say that earlier. I think I did. Maybe not. Gabe, you win five bucks. Now I'm going to hit no. And we're going to move to the monthly subscriber giveaway, which has 157 unique entries. And just to show you, you know, last week was added to this as well. 
There's all the Mexico open information as well as the Zurich, uh, the Zurich review. So this is the whole month of April. All the people that put in different uh, comments on different videos, we had 157 unique entries. And again, once I hit Y, we get our monthly subscriber winner. Gabe, <laughs> I felt like this happened last, uh, this happened last month. I think Barry won not only the weekly as well as the monthly, but this week we get Gabe that does the same thing. Uh, just to show you that it's not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Scuffed comes to mind, but that's not what I'm, it rigged. Uh, that's not rigged. You see, Gabe had 10 entries. He won this one on the DFS preview. This changes every single time I hit Y. So Joanne, there we go. That was with the Masters. So unfortunately, it wasn't Joanne, but instead it was Gabriel. And I'm just doing this to show you guys that it's not rigged. It, it truly isn't rigged. I would never do that. So uh, congratulations, Gabe. You win the weekly as well as the monthly giveaways. So I'll reach out to you. We'll be in touch. Uh, let's move on. So one other giveaway that I like to do is more of like a rebate. This is the prize picks. Uh, giveaway but again it's a rebate if you sign up on prize picks and use the promo code sweet spot while signing up and then you put some money in your account i'm just gonna give you 20 dollars back i don't care how much money you put in there but i believe the minimum deposit uh from prize picks is 20 dollars. they're gonna give you a match up to 100 dollars using the sweet spot promo code so what that means is if you put 100 dollars in they're gonna give you an additional 100 dollars. so you'll have 200 in your account now I give you uh, the uh, the possibility of, of playing for free by signing up and putting that minimum deposit of twenty dollars in your account. That way, then I give you that twenty dollars back. Now I'll give it to you regardless if you put twenty, forty, sixty, eighty, a hundred in your account. Price is just going to match your deposit. So I'm trying to make it like a, a win win for all of us. Use the promo code. I give you $20 back, then you have $40 in your account and you just get to play prize picks for free. Run, you know, play until maybe um, that money goes away or whatever. There's a free flex play every Friday. So you can play up to $20 basically free. So you put your 20 bucks in, say you do five picks for a flex or six pick picks for a flex. You don't hit it. You get that $20 back as a credit from prize picks, but still you get to use that $20 into next Friday's and so on and so forth. It's a, it's kind of an interesting way to kind of build your bankroll a little bit. Cause you might not hit every single week, but the one time you do that adds to your little, little bit that you can play a little bit more and more. So again, this is available to you. Check the link or check the description of this video. There's a link there that I'll send you to the prize picks homepage. You go to hit the sign up button. And boom, uh, sweet spot will already be pro uh, populated into your promo code. So again, that is available to you. That's all that I have for giveaways uh, and giveaway reminders, basically. So let's go ahead and get into this thing. I got to remember where we're going to start. Um, let's go here. All right, we're going to go into the course information and tournament information. When it comes to the Wells Fargo Championship, there have been years where this tournament has not been played at Quail Hollow. And by the way, Quail Hollow is the golf course we're using this week. If you're unfamiliar, uh, there's a thing called tournament fact sheets. You just go to the gcsaa.org. They're going to provide tournament fact sheets for all the PGA Tour events. You can see which golf course is being used. You know, all the fun statistics that you can see over here on the side, what grass is being used, all that good stuff. Now, I'm going to go back to looking at this because I want you guys to understand my spreadsheet, the, the, uh, the cheat sheet, is excluding 2022. It's also going to exclude 2017 for course history. Uh, I thought about using tournament history, but it just, the more I thought of it, the more it just didn't make sense. By the way, you also had 2020, which was canceled. Oh my God, sometimes this spreadsheet stuff bothers the hell out of me. Like, what are all these little arrows for? I don't need arrows. Uh, anyways. So 2022, 2020, and 2017, Quail Hollow was not used 
for the golf course for this tournament. I mean, obviously 2020, the tournament just didn't exist. That's something you should keep, you know, keep note of. Because if you're going to do any of your research on any of the other sites that you might use, just remember that. If they're using course history, make sure it's not tournament history. In case you're okay with tournament history, which by all, you know, by all means, do whatever you feel is comfortable. I personally would rather look at course history. Uh, and all the buckets, by the way, when it comes to course history buckets, exclude 2020, 20, or 2022, 2020, and 2017. So they will not be looking at course history. Uh, the, the, the buckets won't be looking at those years for course history. I wanted to uh, just mention that in case you didn't know. I'm sure you have heard that elsewhere, but just a, a quick reminder. Now, let's go back to the, the uh, tournament fact sheet. This is the Quail Hollow Golf Club. There are some pieces of information you can use for research if you want. You could look at the architect, George Kopp. You could also look at the renovation architect, which was Tom Fazio. I don't know exactly what kind of renovations he did, but you could add those into your pieces of, of research, especially when it came to like course history. If you want to look at maybe similar golf courses that might be comparisons, like course comps, basically. You could do that. Not going to really highly encourage that. If I was going to put a percentage of importance, maybe like five, that's about it. But you could use that as a data point. Of course, you can use Quail Hollow as a data point. Charlotte, North Carolina, the southeast of the United States, you could use that. Uh, predominantly, golfers from the southeast play well on southeast golf courses. This is North Carolina, so you could also use... You know, all the golfers from North Carolina, even South Carolina or Virginia or anything around the state of North Carolina. Um, it could be a little bit of a. Basically, what I would say is it would be a tiebreaker, if anything. And again, if I was putting a weight on that, maybe two percent, you know, two to five percent. I am a firm believer that wherever you grew up. You're not only comfortable playing on those types of golf courses, but you are also familiar with the grass that is used, especially even on overseed, because guess what? If you grew up there, you're playing on overseed during the winter months. So I think you could add that as a piece uh, of data to your research. I want to have a, a huge issue with that. R71, 7,500 yards, stint meters running at 12. That's pretty normal on the PGA Tour. I think that's fast-ish kind of. Well, like 11 and a half is where I would probably say average is maybe a little bit north of 11 and a half. And this is like feet. How does it? I forget how the terminology work, but it's you use a stint meter, which is just a. A marble ramp, as I like to call it sometimes, where they just have a golf ball roll down a 45 degree. It, I mean, they do it in different areas of the green uh, and see how far it rolls out. And then obviously, on average, it rolls out about 12 feet. That's what that means with the stint meter. So it's pretty fast, not super fast. You know, 11.5 would mean it would run out 11 and a half feet. So this is six inches faster <laughs> than a stint meter at 11 and a half, which again, you know, it, it still is fast, fast ish. Uh, you can use that as a data point. Same with average green size. I wouldn't, ha I wouldn't have an issue with that. But I, most of this is just noise. I don't think it's really all that important, but I'm just I'm going over this to give you some data points you could use. If you really want to get down to the nitty gritty, you could do this very, very, very easily. Uh, and, and it might be overkill. Who knows? But your greens, we have an overseed on there. You can see all base turf is Bermuda grass. Now, some people don't understand what that means. Your grass when it grows out of dormancy, will basically bully out all of the overseed that's there. And a lot of times, what golf courses will do is they'll burn out the overseed. So they'll put chemicals on, you know, the POA that is currently residing as the overseed. They'll put chemicals on it to burn it out so the Bermuda can come in uh, without really any resistance. The fact that it says that it's overseed makes me believe they didn't do any burnout. Now, some courses just allow the Bermuda or whatever the base grass is to grow through, uh, which will in turn kill the overseed grass within time, and especially when the temperatures get hotter. POA doesn't really thrive. 
in very hot temperatures, neither does bent grass, neither does rye without uh, substantial water. Bermuda, on the other hand, can survive without that much water. So that's one way you can kill the overseed is don't water it as much. And then the Bermuda will just thrive because it's used to that type of uh, condition. So there are several ways that that occur. We don't have enough data. We don't have enough information. What I will say is I would steer away from people who are, who are going to tell you like, you know, this is just pure Bermuda or this is pure bo uh, POA. This, in a way, reminds me of, like, the Valero Texas Open. I didn't use any grass stats uh, during the Valero Texas Open because I didn't know, was it actually Bermuda or was there enough overseed on it? Like, what percentage do we have Bermuda versus POA? This week, though, I'll tell you right now, I do have both POA as well as, I mean, you can see this on the cheat sheet. I'll just pull up the cheat sheet. Um, I guess I don't have the information. Let me just update this real time. Uh, these NAs should say Bermuda and the secondary grass. Sorry. That isn't how you do that. Then the secondary grass over here. Um, I have to redo that, but oh well. This is POA. So when you come to the cheat sheet, just know, you know, we're looking at total POA events from 2013. The same goes with the average. So their average finishing position going back to 2013 on POA and then their percentages and then one full year's worth of POA tournaments and what the average finishing place was there. Same applies for all of the Bermuda, Bermuda stats. So keep that in mind uh, when you do come to the cheat sheet and look at this information that is what you get with the grass stats here same applies again for bermuda going back to 2013 for your overall your top 10 percentage and that stuff this is just for data points once again now i do include that into the sweet spot score and then i also have my rankings i'll cover that in the strategy video tomorrow but just being fully transparent with you guys that's what you can get from the cheat sheet so going back to the grass conversation, I don't think it really, it's going to be extremely hurtful to include both grasses into your model. I don't care if you go 70% on one grass, 80% on, on, you know, 70 to 80% on one grass, 20 to 30% on, on one. I don't think it matters as long as I think you incorporate both because obviously they're showing us this. It must matter. So I, I wouldn't say it's pure Bermuda, and I wouldn't look at pure, pure uh, Bermuda. But if you wanted to include it, I have no issues with that, but also include POA. So hopefully that makes sense. You can also find other additional notes. I didn't really see anything that was all that important. Like if you're looking at the President Cup routing, it, that is, I don't even know what you're doing if you're looking at that. It doesn't matter. We don't need to look at that because you're not looking at the President Cup information you wouldn't why well, i don't know why you would but that is all that i have when it really comes to like the agronomy of the golf course now i also have kind of like a, a course breakdown you can kind of see off to the right i have whatever the golf course was last year uh tpc potomac this year obviously we have the quail hollow club so i have obviously the yardage the par Yard, you know, yards per par, all that stuff. Not, that's not really important to me. I would say pause the video. If you want to read the descriptions that I have here, pause the video. Um, let me zoom in just a little bit more so you guys can see. So pause the video if you want to read what I have as a description. What I personally like to do is kind of look at the shot shapes that I have here. Now, these aren't required shot shapes. These are just preferred. And I think when it comes to scoring potential, the preferred shot shape is the best way to, to get the lowest score. I mean, it has the best possibility to get the lowest score. So as you can see, it's pretty even. I mean, it is even. We have three draws in total, one off the tee, two approach, versus two off the tee fades, and one approach that's a fade. That would be beneficial. Again, not required, just preferred. 
So I don't really see, you know, when it comes to shot shape, what is more important. And with that, I don't think it really matters who you, who you build your lineups with. Now, again, I have this on my cheat sheet. You can see this uh, in column P when it says shot shape. Uh, Cam Young, I believe, he hits of both directions, but I, I think his actual... Last few times I saw him was, was he was in a draw. Let's just say both. It's fine. We can call it both. Um, and Tom Kim hits a fade. We all know that. Easy peasy. I'm not going to go through all of them, but again, this information is here for you on the cheat sheet. Again, check the description of this video. I have a link there that I'll send you here. But you can look at all that stuff there. Again, I don't see a benefit when it comes to shot shape. It's a long golf course uh, where I think your bombers, I, a lot of people are saying this anyways, are going to strive. So definitely keep that into consideration when you're building your lineups this week. Let's take a look at the tournament information. So basically, I go over how many golfers are in the field. So we have it's a 156-man field, by the way. It's the first 156-man field that we have to start the year. Uh, well, not so much to start the year, but it's the first one we have this year. A lot of the events prior to this were either invitationals, which only had 132 or like 121 to 122 people or other opens that because of daylight, they couldn't add more than 144 people. So we're finally at 156, which is a full field event, like a truly full field event. The 156 golfers, our strength of field is 592. That is basically just looking at OWGR and FedEx rankings by the old OWGR standards. Remember, they had a formula that had numbers that range anywhere between 200 to 900. Now they have something completely different, a rating scale. I kept the old strength of field. I like seeing a bigger number personally, just to give a better idea of how, how much more difficult this tournament is based off of strength of field. So I don't have included um because there was always you would add points to this based off of how many top 10 golfers in the i think the current fedex cup were in the field and it would add something like 10 points or whatever so it doesn't have that bonus it just has owgr and fedex and whatever that that formula is it does not do the home tournament bonus um so that's what we get with 592. And I've been I've been very um consistent with this number throughout all the tournaments that I cover. So 592, it's on the high side. Of course, this is an elevated event. Forgot to mention that, but of course, you probably already knew that, right? 156 golfers. Now, we could go and do a rundown of how many golfers in the top 50, but I'm gonna leave that to you. That's that's available in the cheat sheet. You can see the OWGR here did forget to update it after the Mexico Open. So this will be old, if I believe, by the time you get to it. Um, I don't really think it matters all that much. 592 actually might be different. So yeah, I'll update it by the strategy video tomorrow. I apologize for not having an update right now. So it probably will change, if I'm being honest. But you can see what the OWGR is here, what their FedEx ranking was from the the year pr uh, prior because that's how it goes by the old strength of field uh, rating scale would use the FedEx Cup standings at the end of the year that is after the tour championship so um, that is what we that's what goes in the strength of field uh, and again I'll leave it up to you to see how many of the top 50 are in the OWGR obviously with the strength of field of 592 it's a tough tournament so Really, that is all that I have when it comes to the golf course and the tournament information. There's probably way more data, way more information than you truly needed to know. But again, I like to be transparent. So that is what we covered. So we'll go on to the next one. So when it comes to pass optimal and GPP winning lineups, um, really, we got to start at the 2017 PGA Championship. Because Quail Hollow was used here, and that is why they did not play the Wells Fargo Championship in 2017 at Quail Hollow. Of course, if you were with me during the course information and uh, the course and tournament information segment, um, just to show you really quickly once again, 
2017 was played at Eagle Point. So 2017, we wouldn't use for course history when it comes to Quail Hollow, but what you could do is use the 2017 PGA Championship because this was played at Quail Hollow. I want to start here with pass optimal and GPP winning lineups, mostly because this is probably closer. Uh, maybe not. I was going to say this is probably closer to the strength of field we're going to see this week. But I believe the PGA Championship is always in the 800s. I don't think I have it for 2017, but it's it's probably up there. Uh, we'll start here with the optimal lineup. It left $2,000 on the table. Now, this does include a little bit different of a field than this week because you're allowing 20 PGA professionals into the PGA Championship. Of course, if you didn't know that, now you do. Uh, those 20 players can be kind of mitigated. You don't have to, you know. It takes up 20 spots from tour golfers. Now, the PGA players, the PGA professionals, they can hold their own to some extent. I mean, we do see those golfers make the cut here and there, but it's not quite the same. Like, these tournaments won't, they're not really one and one the same. I do still like it, though. I, I, I do like looking here, so never mind what I'm talking about. I think as we look at the optimal lineup in 2017, you're going to see a lot of 10K golfers up here. A lot of 8Ks and stuff like that, but you're going to see 6Ks sprinkled in, uh, especially with some 7Ks, and that is why the optimal lineup was so low. You had, uh, not so low as, uh, I meant by price point, why it's low. So you had an $8,900 Justin Thomas who won, which I think is actually what his, his price point is this week, which is kind of funny. Maybe it's a sign, maybe not. $8,900 Justin Thomas, Two 7K golfers in Louis Ustazen and Patrick Reed, then a $6,800 Francesco Molinari. So, just with these four golfers, we still have $20,000, basically $20,000. It's $19,500 that we can still play with. But your optimal had Hideki Matsuyama, and because you could not afford to put Ricky Fowler, the next person was Kevin Kisner. And if it wasn't Kisner, then it was Graham Dillette. So, you're still leaving like $2,000 on the table. Is that something we can expect this this week? Maybe. You know, like, Kisner, I would say in 2017, was no slouch. If you know who Graham Dillette is, you know that he is a ball striker and he had the potential, you know, to play well. He just always was marred with a back injury all the time. Now, obviously, we know the pedigrees of Louis Ustazen, Patrick Reed, and even Francesco Molinari. Now, 2017... Maybe they weren't really in that form, but obviously we know them now to be pretty good golfers, so that the price point's probably not true to form. I did create a more realistic lineup, just so you guys are aware of that, uh, and just see that. We use kind of the same, well, we use the same four golfers, but instead of Hideki Matsuyama, we use Ricky Fowler, and then we drop down to Matt Kuchar at $8,800, who finished ninth that year. That gets you $50,000. So that would be following a 10-8-8-7-7-6 approach when building lineups. And that mean that by salaries, a 10K golfer and above, two 8K golfers, whatever price point they are in the 8K range, two 7Ks, again, whatever price point they are, and a 6K, whatever price point that is. One thing to note, JT, uh, $8,900, really close to 9K, obviously. And the same goes with Matt Kuchar. So it's just one way to think about building lineups. 10, 8, 8, 7, 7, 6. And you all, you all know that I always advocate for the 10, 9, 8, 7, 7, 6 approach. This is just one off of that. You always can make two substitutions. Obviously, we did one with a 9K down to an 8K. It works. So that was your 2017 PGA Championship. Now, getting back to the Wells Fargo Championship, we got to skip 2017 and go right to 2018. So in 2018, your optimal lineup left $1,000 on the table. That's hard to stomach. It's very difficult to build lineups leaving that much money on the table and really feel, I mean, you could feel confident about it, but when the dust settles after the tournament's over, you kind of kick yourself going, why did I leave that much money on the table? It makes no sense. So I have two lineups. You can see the optimal or the golfers here with the little black tick marks. We had Jason Day at 10,200. Then we had two 7K golfers, almost flat seven. Bryson at $8,000, Phil Mickelson at 92, and then Peter Uline at $7,500. So 
just to recap, three 7K golfers, an 8, a 9, and a 10. Just to say that in a different, uh, a different, jeez, I want to say sort, but that's not the word, in a different combination, that is a 10, 9, 8, 7, 7, 7 build. So you kind of see it's still kind of, it, it's, it's hovering around that 10, 9, 8, 7, 7, 6 approach. Now, a more realistic lineup are all the golfers here with the green um, salaries, which, again, 10, 9, 8, 7, 7, 7. So, again, it still follows kind of that same, that same method, 10, 9, 8, 7, 7, 7. Let's go to 2019. In 2019, they left $1,500 on the table. So, I don't know if it's a Wells Fargo, like a Quail Hollow thing to leave a lot of money on the table, but it's almost looking that way. In 2019, your optimal lineup left $1,500 on the table, and it used a 9K golfer in Sergio Garcia. A 9K golfer in Paul Casey. An 8K golfer in Johnny Vegas. A 7K golfer in Joel Damon. And two 6K golfers, one who won the tournament, Max Homa, and the other, Jason Duffner, who finished fourth. This left $1,500 on the table. Now, again, a more realistic lineup actually would be using two 10K golfers, an 8, a 7, and two 6s. Now, if you're like, uh, I don't see how you can make that substitution. Like, you, you know, this doesn't fit the two substitutions. Well, it does. Do you see a 9K golfer on the board? No. So we sub from a 9K up to a 10K. Do you see two 7Ks on the board? No. You sub a 7K down to a 6K. So that, that's how you get the 10-10, skip the 9, go to an 8, go to a 7, skip the second 7, and get two 6s. So... That's what I mean by two substitutions. Now, you could also just remove Justin Rose and put in Sergio Garcia. I don't know what the point total would have been there, but you would leave $400 on the table and you would go 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 6. So you could build a lineup that way. Now, it doesn't really look like you can do much more than that. Maybe we could go with a Justin Rose, skip Ricky Fowler, put in Paul Casey at 9,500. And let's move this 67 to maybe 78. Yeah, this is 50,000 on the button. So you could do a 10K golfer in Justin Rose, 9K golfer in Paul Casey, 8K golfer in Johnny Vegas, $7,800 Keith Mitchell, $7,600 Joel Damon, and $6,600 Max Homa. So you could still do the 10, 9, 8, 7, 7, 6. It wouldn't be the optimal, and it probably wouldn't score you know, more than the, the realistic lineup that I already put on there. But it's going to give a run for the money for the whoever the GPP winning lineup was that week. I don't have that information, but I, I guarantee you it would have given a run for the money. So that was 2019. Going to 2021, your uh, optimal lineup left $600 on the table, and I actually did record a GPP winning lineup that used all $50,000 of the salary. Now, your optimal use a 10k golfer, a 9k golfer, an 8k golfer, 7 7 6. And you left $600 on the table, $6200 Scott Piercy. So that was your optimal lineup, 10 9 8 7 7 6. And it's like a mid 7, a low 7, high 9, high 8, very low 10. That matters anything to you. The optimal, again, use that 10K golfer, Rory McIlroy, $9,800 Victor Hovland, $8,900 Abe Answer, a $6,800 Luke List. Then we got to scroll down to get our two 7K golfers down here in Cam Davis and Lonto Griffin. So that used up $50,000 of the salary. So, I, I mean, I do this every single week, and a lot of it is very close to the 10, 9, 8, 7, 7, 6. You can make a couple different substitutions, but I think if you want to start building your lineups that way, I think that's great. And if you can, like if, say, you're building lineups and you get to a couple 6K golfers that you're like, ah, I don't really know if I like these guys. You know, I, I just might as well play one of the lower 6Ks. That might be able to bump you up from a 10-9 start to a 10-10 start. 
or maybe you don't want any of the 6K golfers and you just want to go with three sevens. Maybe you do a 10, 9, 8, 7, 7, 7, or maybe you do a 10, 8, 8, 7, 7, 7, because that still works in the, in the realm of possibilities. That still works with the whole substitution method that I have to go along with the 10, 9, 8, 7, 7, 6 start. So lots of stuff to consider, but I do believe starting 10, 9, 8, 7, 7, 6 this week is the way to go. We're not going to cover 2022 because 2022 was played at a different golf course. But in case you wanted to take a look at it, your optimal lineup left $2,100 on the table. Crazy. Um, your GPP winning laps left $400 on the table. And then I had a realistic optimal lineup as well. So just go over those really quickly. You had a 9, 8, 8, 7, 7, 6 start with your optimal. Again, this, this left $2,100 on the table. Your GPP winning lineup had that 9, 8, 8 start. And then you had a 6K, a 7K, and another 8. So just to repeat that in a different way, a 9, 3 eights, a 7, and a 6. This left $400 on the table. Very unique GPP winning lineup. Uh, I've never seen lineup a lineup like that <laughs> where you're leaving money on the table and you're not starting with a 10K golfer. I imagine that's probably this cascade method. I think that's how you can get there. Um, who knows? A more realistic, more realistic lineup would have started with a 10, 9, 2 eights, a seven and a six. So you can already see it still follows that 10, nine, eight, seven, seven, six method, but makes one substitution and it kicks a seven up to an eight. And that's how you get the two eights. And again, it's a flat eight in Cameron Young. So that will cover the pass optimal in GPP winning lineups. Let's go ahead and get into a review of the Mexico Open. So Tony Finau won the John Rahm Open. I don't know if you guys knew that, that it was termed the John Rahm Open, but he certainly did. He beat Rahm by three strokes. Um, the goal to call it the John Rahm Open was definitely um, worth it because it just, if it was Rahm, if Rahm was hitting his shots a little closer on Sunday, I bet you Rahm takes the title. And it would have been very similar to Last week or last year, look at that. Finau, Rom, Brandon Wu. Finau, Rom, Brandon Wu. Like it's the same. That's why we look at course history. That's why we look at last year finishing positions because we see a lot of the same names show up. I mean, it makes sense to me. That's why. That's why I do it. Um, but yeah, the John Rom Open was won by Tony Finau. I want to start somewhere different. Usually I'll tell you like the summary and how successful the buckets were. Let's start with the optimal uh, lineup, the GPP winning lineup, and then the sweet spot optimal, then go into the buckets. So your optimal lineup left $500 on the table. And that consisted, again, of all the golfers here in the black tick marks. Tony Finau, Brandon Wu, Akshay Batia, Emiliano Grillo, Eric Cole, and... Cameron Champ, believe it or not. So that was a 10, 8, 7, 7, 7. I'm sorry, two eights. I, I miss Brandon Wu. 10, 8, 8, 7, 7, 7. Pretty balanced. And again, you're leaving $500 on the table. And that is pivoting away from John Rahm. Tony Finau was the second highest owned golfer on the slate. And the GPP winning lineup, by the way, used, there was four people tied at the top. Tony Finau and Rom together. They used them both. And then they went down to Akshay Petit at 7,400 and three 6K golfers. Carson Young, by the way, uh, I, I like Carson Young. I, I was already kind of having, uh, I've already, I've thought about, Jesus, I don't know what, what am I trying to say here? I've paid attention to him at different tournaments. Uh, I don't remember exactly where he got my attention. I know he did finish 19th at the RBC Heritage, which obviously I think is worth mentioning. Missed the cut with his teammate at the Zurich. Not a big deal. But he's a solid golfer. Uh, I don't know if you guys play Rainmakers. I, I, I just started getting into it. I put $30 worth of cards in last week, and I won $30. So I... I basically got free cards 
that's how I look at it. It's just like DraftKings gave me free free cards to play with going forward. I got a couple Carson Young ones, and he's he's the guy who actually helped me win money. So I was like, oh, okay, that's awesome. Like that, it paid dividends, but not here to talk about Rainmakers. Carson Young, what a great play. Uh, all four of those lineups, obviously, the same lineup left zero money on the table. So your optimal scored 710. Your GPP winning lineup scored 685. So there was obviously a 25 point difference. Within that 25 point difference, that's where I want to see the sweet spot optimal. Unfortunately, the sweet spot optimal only scored 679. So it was six points behind the GPP winning lineup. To me, if the sweet spot optimal can't beat the GPP winning lineup, the sweet spot process failed. And that, I'll, I'll, I'll hold on to that. But there's more to go along with that. So your sweet spot optimal, 10-7 Tony, $8,500 Grillo. Then we have three 7K golfers, Akshay, Eric Cole, and Cam Champ. And then we come down to the 8K SH Kim. Let's go to the buckets now because I want to explain why the, the sweet spot optimal did not beat the GPP wing lineup. And it's something I, I know I need to look at going forward. It's been on my mind for a long time. I get reminded of tournaments like this where this happens. So let me tell you why, uh, what I'm talking about. Remember what I said in the beginning of this segment that I, I usually start here, but I wanted to go elsewhere. Pay attention to this column right here. This has formulas driven that create Y's or, no, or N's. So yeses or no's. And this is all based off of how many golfers finished inside the top 10 versus what I had projected. Now, if this top 10 number falls outside of the range that I've projected, then it looks at the optimal lineup. And if the optimal lineup stays within the projected amount, it's a success. If, if it goes past these two kind of um, conditionals, like if it's still outside the range of these, both these conditionals, uh, obviously the projection, then it'll be a no. Uh, all the buckets were successful. 36 buckets out of 36 buckets were successful. Remember, we didn't look at last year buckets. We also didn't look at course history buckets, but that doesn't change the fact that I still have projections for each of these buckets. The reason we didn't look at them is because we only had one real true year of Vedanta Vallarta being the, the golf course that was used for the Mexico Open. So why, why look at course history? Why look at last year stats? It's, it's difficult. Now, if I had a universal uh, bucket system where we could look at, you know, how, like, what's the frequency or what's the rate of success that, you know, a last year one or two, three, four, five, six... How often do those show up inside the top 10, regardless of whatever the tournament is? Uh, I don't have that yet. Working on it. Very excited, by the way, because I did I uh, finished that part of the, the database this weekend. So we're getting closer, getting closer to putting it to a website. Um, but excluding all that, again, I still do projections for it based off of what the Mexico Open has provided us since 2013 which includes the wgc cadillac championship which was in florida so i, I know it, it makes no sense but the projections were still successful <laughs> for for a course history last year it doesn't make any sense uh but the, the other buckets we did look at still were successful now if you're kind of watching this and you know the bucket system and and you know that if the buckets are successful then we should have hit the optimal lineup right one Huge caveat. One huge caveat. Um, I, I, I included this column here just to see, you know, when we start getting into trouble, when it comes to, hey, that average salary is pretty high. Maybe you want to rethink the projections because you won't be able to own or you won't be able to roster golfers with high salaries, especially if, if the top 10 doesn't shake out the way that you can actually roster those guys together. Maybe you guys already know what I'm talking about. Tony Fino and John Rahm. So one bucket derailed all of this. And it was my recent Form 2 bucket. 
Now, I want you to take a look at this because this is something I always talk about every single week when it comes to be careful because these 10K golfers can still show up inside the top 10 and it still will provide, you know, uh, a successful bucket projection, but you won't be able to roster both golfers in a lineup to hit the optimal lineup. That's exactly what happened this week. So you can see my projection on the screen, and maybe you can't uh, make sure it's in, in 10K or not 10K, geez. Make sure it's a 1080p, or if you can get to 4K if it allows. Um, you know, take a look at this. The projection is 2.39 to 3.99. Obviously, with the max projection, we always round up. So 3.99 goes to 4. The min projection rounds down to 2, point th or, uh, to two from 2.39 to 2. Now, there's another one that I like to look at over here called the max projection and miscellaneous information. This is more of a kind of a, um, a conservative number. You can see 3.31 for a max projection is lower than 3.99. I use this to either bump it. it I really use this to bump the minimum down if, if, if need be. 3.31 uh, still rounds up to 4. So the minimum still stays at two, the max still stays at four, and that's what I had in the optimizer. I had two to four for the projection. Well, let's take a look. 2023 DK page. Uh, I know it might look messy. Let me hide this stuff right here. Let me go ahead and sort by uh, recent form twos. And in the top 10. Like I said, we're looking for two to four golfers that finish inside the top 10 from the recent form two bucket. We have our two golfers. It's Tony Finau and John Rahm. I think if Rahm and Finau were flipped, we probably hit the optimal lineup with the sweet spot optimal. But because it was Finau first and then Rahm, Rahm was not in the optimal lineup. You cannot build a, you know, the highest scoring lineup by using ROM. Obviously, a GPP winning lineup actually took down or uh, used ROM and Finau together to take down the GPP. But unfortunately, the true optimal did not use ROM. So, therefore, when we go back to the summary, you can see one golfer in this optimal lineup was used. And therefore, we can't use. Um, I mean, that, that's how we didn't hit the optimal. Now, why, we didn't, the, why the sweet spot optimal wasn't better is because we actually had to move down from there. So we had to go from Finau down to SH Kim. And you can see SH Kim finished 24th place. That wasn't enough DK points to keep up with the GPP winning lineup. So because we couldn't use ROM, you know, well, first of all, the optimizer that I built looks at the best available lineups. And the one that had Finau and Rom in it scored less points than the one with Finau and SH Kim. So I think when I had uh, Finau and Rom and I followed the rest of the buckets with the sweet spot process, it scored like 659 or something like that. So it wasn't even close. 679 was what we got with using Finau and SH Kim. So bucket system was 100% successful. But you couldn't build uh, an optimal lineup or a sweet spot optimal that would have taken down the GPP. Because. Again, sometimes this happens Two 10 keg golfers from that bucket finish inside the top 10 or even inside the top five. And therefore you can't include both of them. You have to choose one of them. So that is something, again, I need to look at. Uh, just if you're curious, what needs to happen is, you know, kind of have to do the eyeball test. There were 13 golfers in that bucket this year. 13. On average, we see about 15. Now, the projection is high because the success rate is high. And the amount of golfers in that bucket for this year isn't that much different than what we normally see on average. Also, 61% of the strength of field points went towards this bucket. So that just inflates this projection even more. With that inflated projection, we still have to keep in our mind this information over here. There were five golfers priced at 9K and above. So let's go back to that uh, bucket. Let me go ahead and put these filters back on. And let's just go by salaries. So five golfers, 5K and above. 
Benny Ann, Nikolai Hoygaard, Gary Woodland, Finau, and Rom. Now, the likelihood of two of those guys being inside the top 10 were pretty high, right? Obviously, we got that with Rom and Finau. Then it drops down, uh, well, I should say there are several 8K golfers and above, and then it drops down, you know, 7K down to the 6K range. Nothing really lower than $6,800. Um, just trying to see here. Yeah. So I, there has to be a, some kind of safeguard. I need to figure out some kind of safeguard to let us know, or at least, you know, blink lights like, hey, 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 this projection is high. Maybe we don't select these golfers because this price point here is too high. It, there has to be something. Uh, yeah, 38% of the, the player pool was... 9k and above that's pretty maybe that's what i need to look at because this number alone doesn't really tell me a lot or maybe it does maybe if this is over the average ah oh, no 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 I, I i don't think that this bucket really fails or you know we have issues with this bucket if it isn't rom finau because if it's any other combination of like Rom and say Benny Ann. There's still enough salary w wiggle room where we could have built a lineup that would have been the optimal lineup following the, the buckets. Same kind of applies with any of these 9K golfers and below. Like there's a thousand point or yeah, thousand dollar difference between Finau and the next guy who who was Gary Woodland in this recent form two bucket. So and of course, if it wasn't Finau and say he finished outside the top five and maybe SH Kim bumps up to like 12th, 13th place, he's probably scoring more points, obviously, and that might be the true optimal. You never know. So, yeah, the buckets were 100% successful, which is wonderful. That's awesome. But it didn't help us this week. Now, the last piece, the second piece when it comes to um, the bucket system or the sweet spot process is really the the marquee tee times. So let me go ahead and select all, I think, yeah. Marquee tee times, I include this in the optimizer. We build lineups this way. The rule is you pick out of the nine groups that I have colored, you can kind of see there's a, a color combination over here. Of the nine groups that I have highlighted, and of course I go through this in my strategy video, so I'll be covering this for the Wells Fargo Championship uh, tomorrow, Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time in the strategy video, we'll be covering this information. Uh, the rule is you find two to four groups, two to four. And out of those two to four groups, you select one golfer each, no more than one. And you anchor your lineups around that because in 90% of optimal lineups, it has followed these marquee tee times where two to four groups have one golfer that represent the optimal lineup. The other 10%, we either have zero or less than two, or we have more than, uh, more than four, or we have duplicates where there are golfers from the same group that are in the optimal lineup together. That's very infrequent. I think, uh, I think out of maybe a hundred and let's see, there's, yeah, I think we're on like over, we're over a hundred now out of the hundred that we've, we've gone through only two, somewhere between Two to three, I think, or it's two to three times we've actually had uh, golfers from the same group in the optimal lineup. So it's very infrequent that that happens, and that's why we don't. That's why there are these rules in place. So two to four uh, golfers. I'm sorry, two to four groups, which is, you know, still it still means two to four golfers because you're only selecting one golfer each from these groups in the optimal lineup. And sure enough, we have that. So Emiliano Grillo represents the optimal lineup. Brandon Wu represents uh, the optimal lineup. So too does Eric Cole. I joked about this during the strategy video last week that Tony Finau wasn't even in an optimal line or like a, in a marquee tee time because he was paired up with like two bums, basically. I shouldn't say that. I don't, I forget who it was. Um, yeah. Nico Echevarria, Echevarria, I should say, and Camilo Vijegas. If you watch that featured group, it was difficult to watch. Finau was the only bright spot. Camillo missed the cut in pain state. Like, it was painful. Let's just put it that way. The snap hooks that the guy was hitting was, was awful. And Echeverria is all over the place. Like, literally all over the place. Right, left. He's playing military golf. Um, so he wasn't in a marquee tee time because he was with those two guys. So obviously he's not up here. 
the only real person to like really think about would be John Rahm. And obviously I played him. You can see that the op, uh, the GPP winning lineup had him, but no one else from the GPP winning lineup is in uh, the market tee times. The optimal lineup is obviously, and so too is the sweet spot optimal, which of course didn't take down, it wouldn't have taken down a GPP, so it doesn't really work, matter. I think you would have won $2,500, but I think it was like, it took like seventh or eighth place. Whatever that $2,500 threshold, that's how much money could have been made with the Sweet Spot Optimal this week. So all in all, just from, you know, if you were to put this on a, a piece of paper, the Sweet Spot process was 100% successful this week. 100%. Marky T times, check. Buckets, 36 out of 36, correct? Check. Even the ones that, you know... If we don't, if we take out the ones we weren't really looking at, so we take 12 away, 24 out of 24 buckets, check. They were all, all successful. And really, when we talk about the John Rom Open, John Rom finished second. He barely missed out on winning this tournament, barely. So it was really close, really close to being a special week. Um, hopefully you guys made your money back or more. I made my money back, uh, primarily because I went 80% in on John Rom. And you still won money going all you know all in on John Rom, despite the forty percent you know ownership that he had in the drive the green. So it was still doable. It was still you know it was still worthwhile. It was a good week. It was a good week. And and by the way, rainmakers for me, dangerous stuff. You best believe I'll be building optimal like sweet spot optimals using rainmakers. There are people out there that are like no, just put your premier lineups in. I'm probably gonna mix it up. Because I don't have a lot of... I'm not going to put a lot of money into it. So I think I have a John Rom card. Uh, Gary Woodland. I, you know, the starter pack that I got last week. I, I chose the one with John Rom in it. I didn't do the one with Tony Finau in it. Uh, the one with John Rom. Because I'm going to have those that card, you know, for the next few tournaments. Uh, well, for the rest of the year, basically. So anyways. Yeah, Rainmakers is a lot of fun. And maybe I'll include a segment in these videos to talk about Rainmakers going forward, but currently right now, not so much. Anyways, that's the review for the Mexico Open. We'll get Now we'll get into the buckets for, um, for the Wells Fargo Championship. Okay, so now that we went over the Mexico Open... Uh, and of course, if you're watching this as a one-off video, we just discussed the, the Mexico Open and how 24 to 24 buckets were success successful, but real, uh, really it was 36 out of 36 buckets that were success successful. The whole sweet spot process, 100% successful. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of confidence using the bucket system this week. Now, one thing to note, I have to remind you, I, I said this earlier in the, the preview video, uh, during the course and tournament information segment. When we look at buckets. Now you can see I have last year buckets up here. I also have course history buckets. That is something worth noting. Now I could have used tournament history buckets. Why I say it that way. Again if you weren't with me. Oh I hate those little side pop ups. Um, if you weren't with me. During the course information piece of this. 2020. The tournament. Uh, was played at TPC Potomac. Reason being is this course was used, Quail Hollow was used for the President's Cup. So they skipped out on 2022 playing at Quail Hollow. But you get it here in 2021. Quail Hollow was used there. 2019 it was used, but obviously 2020 was an off, an off year. 2018 Quail Hollow was used, but not in 2017 because the PGA Championship was played at... Uh, Quail Hollow, so they they skipped out there. But we do have results from 2013 and on, minus those years. So what I did, now if you're unfamiliar with this page, don't worry about it. This isn't that important. This is just the engine that drives the summary page we're looking at. This is the table I pull information from when it comes to top 10 percentages, you know, success rates, counts, frequencies, all that good stuff. We cross out 2020. For last year bucket. Why? Well, the tournament wasn't played in 2020. That's why. We also cross out in 2021. Because why? There was no tournament played in 2020. We cross out the bucket in 2022. Why? Because the tournament wasn't played at Quail Hollow. <laughs> like we're looking at 
I just want to look at last year finishing spots at this tournament at this golf course. I could use last year's finishes. I certainly can. And you certainly can as well. Just keep in mind, usually what happens with the last year buckets, you still always want somewhere between one to three golfers who top 20 that event the year before. This is like your universal bucket system, by the way, for the last year buckets. You still want one to three who are in the last year one bucket, so that top 20 finish from the year before. You want zero to two between the 20 and 40 range, zero to two between the 40 and 60 range, zero to two between the 60 and 80 range, one to three from missed cuts last year, and then somewhere between two to five when it comes to did not plays. That is, from, from me doing this year after year, week after week, I know that to be the trend that follows the last year bucket. So just to repeat that, you can see the ranges that I have here. 1 to 20, 20, it goes by 20 places. So if you, if there's a golfer that top 20 this event, so all the golfers that top 20 this event last year, if you have access to that information, I didn't provide it on my cheat sheet. I don't have it available. But if you have access to this and you can see who finished inside the top 20 last year, just remember you want to select somewhere between 1 to 3 because that typically happens every single week on tour. 1 to 3 golfers, from this bucket, again, from top 20 finishers the year before, finishes inside the top 10 of your event. So just remember that. And then it's just zero to two for the next couple ranges. So if you're in love with three golfers in that 20 to 40 range, maybe you shouldn't be. Same goes with that 40 to 60 range and that 60 to 80 range. Maybe you shouldn't be. So let's actually take a look in 2022. Again, 2022 was played at TPC Potomac, not at um, Quail Hollow. So here are your top 20 golfers right here. So we have Max Homa in the field this week. We've got Keegan Bradley, Cam Young, Matt Fitzpatrick, Rory, Lonto, I believe, is still here. I think Steven Yeager is here. Stuart Sink is here. Adam Shank is here. JT Poston is here. So is James Hahn. So is Brian Harmon. So is Jason Day. So is Kirk Ki Yeah, Kirk Kitayama is here. I don't know about Vegas. CT Pan is here. Ches Reeve is also here, and I don't know about Nick Taylor. So you have several golfers from last year's top 20 here. Almost all, all 20 of them. Out of all 20 of them, play 1 to 3. Play 1 to 3. So if you're going to start anchoring lineups around golfers, just play 1 to 3 of these. And then from there on, it's, it's 0 to 2 until you get to the missed cuts. Let's see, are there any notable missed cuts down here? Um... You know, I would probably actually change my tune because if there aren't any really notable uh, missed cuts, it wouldn't be one to three. I would say this is probably zero to two. Yeah, I'm not seeing anybody that's really worthwhile. Gary Woodland, maybe. I'd actually change. Yeah, I don't see a single person really worth consideration down here. A lot of these guys actually went to the. Uh, live tour but okay now that i know that here's how i would change it this is now zero to two you can actually have a max to three of guys who missed the cut last year so zero to two and then what i would change is actually i kind of joked about this if you liked three golfers that are in here maybe don't you probably change this to one to three without even looking at the golfers that are in it you can see ricky fowler's there Corey connors is here smotherman it's worth a consideration. Um, Siwoo Kim is also in this bucket. So uh, maybe zero to three. Still keep it probably zero to two. And now it puts way more emphasis on golfers who did not play here last year that I think are probably more important to play. But yeah, your top 20s, one, one to three. So I only covered that because if you guys wanted to know, I, I probably would just skip past it. Literally, the, the last year bucket, probably not one to really look at again because we weren't playing at Quail Hollow last year and this tournament is now an elevated event. We have a different strength of field than we did last year. Yeah, last year was 226, by the way. This year it's 592, so it's more than double. Okay, let's move on. Uh, you can follow along with me on the cheat sheet. I do have this available, so if you didn't know, just go to the bucket system portion of it and go to the filter the bucket system because what i'm going to do is go by bucket by bucket 
with all of the ranges in between. We're going to exclude last year and we're going to go right straight to the last week bucket. Now, these are performance trends. The bucket system is a performance trend tool to figure out of the golfers in the field the stats that I have it pointing at, which ones are which ones are important or not. Of course, I do look at strokes gain stats. I know that's a huge popularity thing for most people in DFS, but I like to look at last year finishes, last week finishes, course history, recent form, even salaries, because that is a rank order from DraftKings of who's more important than another golfer. And then I also have strokes gain stats. So strokes gains at the at the end. I like to start at last year, but now that obviously I went over the last year portion, we go into last week. Playing last week does not look like a great thing. Um, most of these buckets are zero to two. I did figure out why that is. Most of the time, the Zurich Classic, the team event, was played prior to this tournament. What that ends up doing with the buckets is it adds a crazy amount of golfers for each bucket. So just to just so you guys understand this, when we're looking at the last week buckets, so 2019 to 2016 is when the Zurich Classic was played the week before. So I'm looking at this bucket right here. Again, this is the engine. This is the engine that drives the summary page that you're looking at. Kind of weird that you have more than 20 golfers inside the top 20 bucket, right? Remember, the, the number one bucket in every single uh, stat that I look at is always top 20. So top 20 finishes, top 20 average finishes, you know, if we're looking at course history or recent form. That's basically what this last week bucket is. Looking at golfers who top 20 the week before. The event from the week before. So obviously we're looking at the Mexico Open. But in 2019, 2018, 2017, and 2016, I was looking at the Zurich Classic. All those numbers are over 20. When you look at all the remaining years, uh, the years on the opposite sides of it, they're all less than 20. So this kind of inflates the number, the, the total number here. And what ends up happening is, now you can also think of it a different way. There are more golfers in that bucket, so there should be better chances to actually finish inside the top 10. Um, it just doesn't end up happening. It just doesn't happen. Like you can see, this is your count of top 10 finishers that, that fall in that bucket. So it doesn't matter if the number is higher, the performance doesn't match. So that's why this, this bucket is like really low. This is what you normally see with the last year, like one, any one bucket, a bucket that has that one. So last year, one last week, one. Um, course history one over here, recent form one, they usually all have a 20% success rate when it comes to most tournaments. This one for the last week bucket has a 10% success rate. So I wanted to see if anything would change if I switched this number to like 25%. So if I did like 25, it changes the projections. It doesn't really change. Like it goes from... 0.63 for your min to 1.05 with your max. If I push it up to 25, it still doesn't go over two. My max projection still doesn't go over two. So this projection will always be zero to two, regardless of the you know 25% uh, is the success rate. Because we still, because what this number looks at, the projections look at success rate. It looks at how many golfers are in that bucket this year, the strength of field. Uh, points that go towards it. Obviously, it's really low. So we're not looking at, you know, a very quality bucket. Also, it doesn't have a very good success rate when it comes to performance. So that is why this projection is so low. And imagine that's also why this projection, the projections are so low for all finishes from the week before. Because remember, the last week six bucket is actually a bucket where golfers didn't play the week before. That's what this bucket represents. Golfers who didn't play the week before this event. This week, we have 81 golfers in that bucket, mostly because this is an elevated event and most people did not want to go to the Mexico Open. We normally see about 55. So my projection here to finish inside the top 10 from this bucket is four to eight. Four to eight golfers are going to be inside the top 10. And it's most likely going to be around six. 
So you literally could create a lineup with all golfers who did not play last week, and you'd probably be okay. You'd probably be okay if you can fit that in your lineup. Of course, you know, that was what we just discussed in the review for the Mexico Open with Rom and Finau being really the only 10K golfers, and that kind of messing up one of the buckets because they both finished inside the top 10. They satisfied the, uh, the bucket projection, but you couldn't build an optimal lineup that way. So you always got to keep that in mind. I still think if you wanted to build four to six, like if you wanted at least four golfers from this bucket in your lineup, be my guest. Like I think it's going to help you out. Um, and it's going to be very successful. You do have 10, 9K and above golfers from that bucket in there. So of the 10, you know, how, how many truly do you think are going to finish inside the top 10? I would say about three. I'd say 30%. Absolutely. With that being said, maybe you can't build a lineup with more than three or four golfers from this bucket in your lineup. So keep that in mind when you're building lineups. Although the projections say, you know, whatever, we might, um, th there is the possibility we actually could have like five or six golfers from this bucket inside the top 10. And you might only be able to play two of them, at most three of them. So just keep that in mind. You have to keep that in mind. And if that's the case, then use the max projections for each of these to the true number. So missed cuts from last week, two is the most. Top 20s from last week, two is the most. Actually, two is the most for any of these buckets, by the way. So that's how I would look at the last week buckets. And just to go over a lot of those golfers really quickly, uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time going through each of these buckets. Uh, let's just take a look at ones and salaries. There we go. So really it's fee now. Uh, we were looking at last week's sixes. Okay, so you see what last week ones are, right? Goes 10K down to the 7K range. So I think it's probably easy to find two golfers to build lineups around. Uh, fee now is not going to be one of them for me. Go to last week's sixes. Here we go. McElroy. Shoffley. Cantley. Your 10K and above golfers. Then it drops to basically every 9K golfer that, that's in the field. Almost all of them. Uh, maybe it is all of them. I, I truly don't know how many are in the 9K range. Seven. Yeah, so you do have all nine or all seven 9K golfers in this bucket. Golfers who did not play last week. Um, so just out of this number here, we've got 10 golfers. Yeah. Um, I could see easily... Yeah, I could see easily three of them finishing inside the top 10. And it, there, there's obviously room for more of them to finish inside the top 10. You just got to make your choices. You got to figure out which ones are the correct combinations to put together to put in your lineup. I will say this, though. The, the 8K range, I think, has enough golfers in it to make considerations where you could do a 10, 9, 8, and then move on from that bucket. Be like, maybe don't select anyone else. But... Are there any set like, okay, Ben Griffin is in this field. I like Ben Griffin on Bermuda tracks, 37th in my model. Uh, Adam Shank seems fine. Svensson seems fine. We can go back to Stevens. I got no issue with that. Nick Hardy just won the Zurich Classic with uh, Davis Riley not too long ago. He's here at $7,100. Justin Suh, Seamus Power, who is our fall swing darling. JT Poston, no issue there. Harris, like there's enough down here even to build lineups around. So, yeah. I think you could probably put anywhere between three to four, three to five golfers from this bucket inside your, in your lineup and be just fine. And maybe it's where you start and you just ignore those that golfed at the Mexico open. So really that kind of concludes the last week buckets. We move on to the course history buckets. So when we look at this again, if you're on the cheat sheet, by the way, this is the best way to actually follow along with me. Let me zoom in a little bit here. The columns B through F have all the bucket numbers that I'm talking about right now. So when I was telling you last, uh, just here with the last week buckets, we were looking at last week's sixes, and I told you to pick somewhere between three to four. Well, if you go ahead and use the filter that's on here, and you do use this to filter out your every other bucket but your last week sixes, that way you can, you can follow along with me. And so now we're on course history buckets. 
So when I talk about course history buckets, like when I tell you, you want zero to two course history ones, what you should be doing on the cheat sheet, if you are, if you do want to follow along, is clear everything out of the course history bucket and just go to the ones. So it's like zero to two is what you want to put in your lineup. Well, we got Rory and Victor Hovland. We, a lot of people are already talking about this week. Same goes with Keith Mitchell. Zero to two, though. Remember that. So if you did like, you know, if you do want to put Rory and Victor Hovland together, probably exclude the rest that are here. That's how I look at it. And that's when I say zero to two, just make sure that you're selecting one to two. Uh, I shouldn't even say make sure. You have the option to select one to two, but probably don't pick more than two. And of course, keep in mind salaries and stuff like that, like I discussed earlier, especially with the uh, the Mexico Open review, you can find yourself in trouble if, if you don't actually look at salaries and stuff like that that can comprise the projections for... Um, well, the projections for the buckets. Zero to two courses three ones. This says one to two, but truly this is zero to two. Remember, we always want a two point buffer. And whenever we can, we always lower the minimum first. If this was zero to one, since we can't go lower than zero, like say this was 0 0.12 and this was 0.87, like 0 0.87, 0 0.12 this rounds down to zero but we want a two-point gap since we can't go further down than zero we go up so that's how we get our two-point gap and that becomes zero to two uh, much like this so this one here says one to two well the max is still two doesn't go over two that brings the minimum down to zero that's going to be the same projection as this course history four bucket which is zero to two this bucket here is one to three, and I always like to confirm with this, this bucket over here, which you guys can't see on the cheat sheet, I have for my own personal use, um, it works out, that, that's perfect. Zero to two works here, wonderful. Zero to two course history fives, and then zero to two course history sixes. So when it comes to the course history buckets, there aren't, well, I shouldn't say they aren't. There's really one true anchor bucket, but we wouldn't consider this an anchor bucket in our strategy video because it has over 30 golfers in it. But the projection is you want at least one. So why don't we take a look really quickly at course history threes, see who are in them. Can we find three golfers we want to build our lineups around? So it starts with Xander, then Tony. I will probably be full fading Tony. I've got no issue doing that this week. Um, it has really nothing to do with his win last week. It just has everything to do with buckets. I don't like the buckets he's in. I'd rather not play him uh, if, unless he was in a true bucket that I did want to choose from. So I'm going to probably skip on out on him. I don't mind playing Xander, but I'll also probably skip out on him. I'll also skip out on Homa. I don't mind going to uh, Sung JM. Wouldn't mind playing Hatton or Fleetwood. I'm probably going to live more in this range when it comes to these golfers. So really one to three, I would maybe sit on the one part. Like I would... One or two. I don't like selecting three golfers from this bucket. Yeah, one to two for me, most likely, is going to be the spot. Adam Scott, by the way, extremely under underpriced, in my opinion. $7,300. That seems like a safe play. Like, I don't mind going with Adam Scott. He can be my number one. And then I could also include, like, Corey Connors, who hasn't really been playing that well. But $7,900, that's fine. And really, anyone in between, Keegan... Woodland, Cam Davis, probably not Hadwin, but definitely options here. So again, one to three from that bucket and really zero to two from all the other ones, which keeps the course history buckets wide open. Going into the recent form buckets. Definitely a tournament where recent form reigns supreme. So this number one bucket, again, remember I go by 20 point positions. So how this reads is over the last seven weeks golfers in this bucket have averaged a finishing position between one to 20th place that means really good recent form uh we have 17 golfers in that bucket this week where we normally see seven so we have 10 more and this is a high success rate ton of well not a ton but quite a bit of strong uh uh strength of field points are going towards 30 percent that bumps this projection up to one to three golfers. You want to pick your golfers or to pick from. 
two to four golfers from recent form twos. I'm kind of also looking at average salaries. So maybe this one to three for recent form ones might not be doable. We'll take a look here shortly. Um, but yeah, average salary is borderline a little too expensive. Um, and then one to three recent form threes. The rest are zero to twos. So again, if you're following along with me on the cheat sheet, that's how I want you to look at this. And by the way, again, this is included. You, um, you have these projections here as well. Go ahead and put a filter on this bucket system and we can go over the same buckets that I'm talking about. So recent form buckets, you can see the projections are the exact same that I have right here. I'm a little more zoomed in, but you have this information on the cheat sheet. And again, when I say one to three, that's what I'm projecting to be inside the top 10. You could use that as how many golfers you want to select from, but also be cognizant of how expensive golfers are in that bucket. What's the likelihood of those guys finishing inside the top 10? And what's the likelihood of you actually being able to roster those golfers? You know, like the, the high end, the high priced golfers in a lineup. If you can't really feasibly make one, then you personally have to choose to drop this projection down. So you got to make those decisions. So let's go ahead and take a look at the recent form one buckets. Make sure you select everybody from the buckets you've kind of already deselected. So recent form one. Your best recent form. We've got Xander, Patrick, Tony Finau, Spieth, Sungjae, Fowler, Ricky Fowler, Cam Young, Sam Burns, Thigala. So again, the projections one to three. I already know I'm starting a lot of my lineups around Patrick Cantlay. I don't. I also don't mind playing Jordan Spieth, Sungjae M, even Ricky Fowler, Cam uh, Cam Young, Sam Burns, and then that's probably where it stops for me for golfers that I know I want to play. I don't mind adding in any of these golfers here, by the way. Probably not Alejandro Tosti. I probably don't care. Um, he was comfortable at the Mexico Open. We'll see if he can ride it out. He had a top 10 there, so he's at this. He's in this event because of that. To get into the next one, he's got a top 10 as well. And if you get so many top 10s, you'll get a, a temporary sponsor or a top temporary exemption. So that's his only route to continue going forward. So if that's enough reason for you to play him, go for it. But Eh, never fall in love with the 6k golfer, right? So, to me, I, I could see Cantley easily finishing inside the top 10. I could see Xander easily finishing inside the top 10. As much as I'm not going to play Tony Finau this week, I could see him easily finishing inside the top 10. Speed is a little bit more volatile for my taste, but I could see him also finishing inside the top 10. Sungjae seems pretty safe. Fowler might be a little bit more of a, you know, a fan pick this week. But remember, he has a win at the Wells Fargo Championship. So I could see him inside the top 10. Uh, and, and really, a lot of these guys, solid golfers. So that 1-3 to three projection, I think, holds up. Uh, and it might actually be more towards the later side. It's just how many of these really high-priced guys are going to finish inside the top 10 versus the low guys. It's kind of what you got to do your versus. Like, you know, what's the likelihood of three of these guys finishing inside the top 10 versus one of these guys finishing inside the top 10. Because if one of these guys finishes inside, inside the top 10, then you only select two of these guys up here. And that's easy. So that's how I look at it. Very easy, in my opinion, to go, you know, 10K golfer and Patrick Cantley, drop down to Sungjae at 9,100, and then grab any of these guys really 80. Well, yeah, Ricky Fowler and down. I could see that being just fine. Let's see, 10, 5, 9, 1, 8, 8. So we have 28,000, we have 20, roughly $21,600 on the table. That equates to what, $7,200 left. You put a 6K golfer in there and then boom, you got two 7Ks, 10, 9, 8, 7, 7, 6. Perfect. So easy to do that with the recent form ones. Uh, looking at the next projection, two to four, and that actually stays the same with the conservative projection. Two to four recent form twos. Again, just only look at recent form twos, take out recent form ones. Morikawa, Fitzpatrick, Hovland, Jason Day, Justin Thomas. So those four golfers kind of make up this. This is a two to four projection. Um, JT and up. Yeah, that's fine. I probably like more 7K golfers than I do anyone above 8K, if I'm being honest with you. I, 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 let's lump in Fleetwood there too. So Fleetwood, I would, like, I'd rather not start with any of these guys up here and just 
grab my two golfers from down here. And I'm probably only going to grab two. Three at most. Remember, though, this is a projection of two to four to be inside the top ten. And you could, I mean, here's, here's the question we got to think. Again, this is PTSD from the Mexico Open. Are these three golfers going to finish inside the top ten? If so, then you only, you only play two. Or you just play one. What's the likelihood of the, these are going to be the guys that represent the top 10 for this bucket versus the rest of these guys? I would choose the field over these three. Especially like Keegan Bradley. We're in the Northeast, right? No, we're not. We're in North Carolina. We're not in the Northeast. Just kidding. Uh, I do like Keegan, though, at this event. Um, yeah, but I mean, we've got a lot of good choices. Let's just put it that way. That I don't think it's going to be one of these three. I don't mind playing Victor Hovland. Probably not going to get around to uh, Matt Fitzpatrick. And I don't mind playing Victor Hovland. Fifth in my model, $9,200. That's a steal, in my opinion. Um, I don't mind going there. And, and JT, by the way, eighth in the model at $8,900. That's exactly where he should be. So he's, he's priced appropriately. Um, yeah, so I would select two golfers from this bucket. I'm not sure exactly who. If I were to go the recent form one route and go Cantley, Sung J M, and then the Ricky Fowler, that only leaves me room with seven K golfers. But this is a great bucket to select seven K golfers from. A lot of these guys are pretty decent. Um, that I don't mind playing. Like again, Adam Scott seems pretty safe to me. I, I would I would play Adam Scott in in all my cash lineups. I don't have no issue playing Adam Scott. And then I don't know, fit someone else in, I guess. I'm really not liking the names when I kind of pass through them. I guess I don't mind going to someone like Benny Ann. You know, he kind of was frustrating last week, but not terrible. I don't like his course history. Never mind. Um, Grillo seems okay. I don't know. We'll let the optimizer select golfers tomorrow, but I don't mind starting with a Cantley start. Let's let's do that next uh, tomorrow. Hopefully, those that are watching, remind me. Let's start with Cantley. Sung Jay and Ricky Fowler. And then we'll go from there. We'll see which golfers are being selected from this bucket because this will all, this will be two to four. We'll be selecting two to four golfers from this bucket pretty easily. And then the next one to talk about recent form threes, one to three from this one. Go in the recent form tab or filter and go to select three. Deselect every, uh, everyone else, but select three. Not everyone else, but you know, the other numbers in that bucket. So this bucket's interesting. Recent form threes. Yeah, Rory hasn't played a lot. I want to say this is his Masters. What is he? He's got a Masters. Oh, no. I got to change this. I forgot to update. This should not even be here. Um, let's see if I can do it really quick. I'm going to do it on the fly. This is probably going to change the projections, by the way. So... I forget to do this. We don't include match play in recent form, and I forgot to exclude it when I was updating it. It won't take long. Um, it's just unfortunate that it, it worked out this way. Just one of those annoying things. I mean, it's really going to change McElroy's... Um, Look at that. It goes from 44 to 85. So we remember where the projections were. Uh, basically 1 to 3, 2 to 4, 1 to 3. Let's see what it, what, it, what it changes to. Go back. Still 1 to 3, but now it's 1 to 4 and 1 to 3. So that's interesting. And that makes sense. I think that's fine. When we were looking at that previous bucket which obviously I think is going to change now. Um, we'll have to take a look at that, which means I need to update this as well. Don't mind me. Back here, take the filters off. Go up here, change this information. 
Then we gotta change the buckets. Then I need to update that on the cheat sheet, which I'll probably just do afterwards. This is actually really, uh, this makes things really interesting. Because, actually this should change the projections a little bit too. Yeah, everything is pretty much the same now, one to threes. So, bucket one, bucket two, and bucket three are still one to three. Um, let's take a look at uh, the changes. I do apologize for that, by the way. Should have known. So, bucket one, we still have Xander, we still have Cantley and Finau. We still have Spieth and Sungjae. I don't remember if there was anyone else in there. We still have Fowler. Just to double check here. Everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, again, let's, let's do the Cantlay, Sungjae, Fowler lineup tomorrow. So interesting. Uh, and then let's see what changed with recent form two. We are missing a 9k golfer, right? Who was it? Was it Morikawa? I think it was Morikawa. Yeah, Morikawa changes to a recent form three. Had to have been. Yep, that would have bumped him down. It would have went from 42 to like 30 something with adding the, uh, the match play. Okay, yep, so we're missing Morikawa and that's it. That's fine, actually. So one to three from this bucket. And I, th I love that because choosing one, two, or th yeah, I'd, just makes life a little easier. Because again, I still like Adam Scott. He's still here. Um, but if I needed to select one, maybe I don't do a Fowler to go with like Cantley and M and I do Justin Thomas. Or maybe I don't do Sung JM and I go with Jason Day. And then I can go Cantley, Jason Day, Ricky Fowler and build lineups that way. That's obviously possible. So now that this has been updated, uh, we are looking at true numbers. One to three here. Now we have Morikawa in this bucket to go along with the rest of the guys. We didn't really touch up on the recent form threes. But again, you want one to three from here. And I think that's fine because this 7K range is, is, is okay. It's pretty decent. I don't have an issue with it whatsoever. I'm going to stay away from Lowry. I don't mind going Tyrrell Hatton. I also don't mind playing Colin Morikawa, but I probably am not going to anchor lineups around Morikawa. He's probably going to be in that 5% or less exposure for me range, and, yeah, and I won't be anchoring lineups around him because there's just too many golfers down here to just slot in. And with projections being 1-3, to three, it's not super great. I, I would take the field over playing the top two guys. I would take the field over Morikawa and Hatton. And if that's the case, then I'm not anchoring around lineups up here. So hopefully that makes sense. And just to go over the rest of them, because we were looking at Rory in recent form threes, he's going to be a recent form five golfer. We were also looking at Homa earlier. I think he was a recent form three. He's, he changes to a recent form four. That projection is zero to two. It's zero to two for the rest of the buckets, by the way. So that includes Homa in recent form four, with the rest of the 7 and 6K golfers. That also is going to include uh, Rory McIlroy in the recent Form 5 bucket. Look at that. It's him and a bunch of 6K golfers. And then recent Form 6 are just golfers who really haven't played on the PGA Tour. And that's Austin Greaser, Quinn Riley, Marcus Bird, and Morgan Deneen. So those are your recent Form buckets. It almost feels like every single week we need to do an update once we figure things out with the recent form buckets. And I think it has a lot to do with the match play. I hate that the match play gets in, uh, included. But anyways, we got to figure it out. We got to sort it out. So moving on to the next one, obviously we're going to talk about salaries. Uh, I should say obviously, but that's what we're going to talk about. So with salaries, we already went through the pass optimal and GPP winning lineup segment just to kind of further um, push that narrative, I guess. Uh, not so much narrative. Uh, that method, the 10, 9, 8, 7, 7, 6. 0 to 2 10K golfers, I'm projecting to be inside the top 10 this week. We have 4, so 0 to 2, that's... I think it's pretty simple. 
Uh, really, zero to two nine k golfers. We have seven of those in the in the field this week. Zero to two eight k golfers, and we've got ten of those in the field this week. It is worth noting that these are pretty high frequency rates, which means every single year a golfer from these buckets finished inside the top ten at these rates. So you can see a lot of hundred percent. We do see an eighty percent. And you can also see in the optimal lineup segment here, we've seen at least one eight and one seven K golfer every single year inside the top 10. So keep all of that in mind. Uh, your seven K range projections two to four, but this, this little projection over here drops my minimum down because this goes up to three. We round up to three, which remember you want a two point buffer. So that drops it down to one. So one to three, is what the projection would be, but our actual max projection in this bucket is 3.4. So we bumped that up to four. I know it's confusing, but the new projection for this bucket is one to four, seven K golfers. Obviously I got my eyes set on uh, Adam Scott. I don't, we, we don't have to look at any of the salary, like the golfers with their salaries. I'm just telling you this. So when you're building your lineups, you know, obviously feel comfortable selecting whatever you want to, um, but hopefully this also gives you a bit more confidence going 10, 9, 8, 7, 7, 6, because the 6k range really don't want any of the low 6k golfers. And there are 47 of them, 47, not a high success rate, not a high frequency rate, no more than one inside the top 10 and no more than one in an optimal lineup. I believe the one that was in the optimal lineup was Scott Piercy. And I don't remember which year, but that was, he was a $6,200 golfer. So that would have been him, uh, representing this bucket otherwise most of your 6k range is 6500 and up that's what represents in most of your top 10s and actually by the way there's been one golfer inside the top 10 that's been 6500 uh i should say in the 6k range 6500 and above every single year inside the top 10 maybe not so much in the optimal lineup but inside the top 10 we have so i just think it's you know feel comfortable playing a 6k golfer this week i know it's hard I know it's difficult for most, but I don't think you, you, should, you should worry too much. And then really the last bucket to wrap up the bucket system is, are the strokes game buckets. Now, if you're unfamiliar with how I do strokes game buckets, I highly encourage you to go check out the video in the description that says, you know, basically the bucket system explained. Check that out. Fast forward to the bucket system portion of it. Uh, I'm sorry, to the stroke scene portion of it and learn what goes into this because I really predicate all my stuff off of off the tee and putting. I don't care about approach. Approach does not go into my, my, my stats. One, off the tee actually paves the way for approach. If you have really good off the tee stats, the potential for having lower approach stats is high. And I'll explain that in a video, in an upcoming video. I'm, I'm going to go over a, you know, do strokes gain stats matter video. Um, that's why I don't really include approach because off the tee dictates your potential on approach, uh, up the approach stat. So why not start with off the tee? And then putting is just frankly, you know, are you getting the ball in the hole? If you have nothing but, you know, three foot birdie putts, if you make all of those putts by the end of a round, you're only gaining like 0.9 strokes putting. So it's, it just seems silly, you know, I mean, your approach that would be really high, most likely. Um, but I want to see those that are still putting well. And so that's why I do it from these buckets. Anyways, let's move on. Strokes gain one are all stats positive. So here you go. You got your approach stats that are positive. We have 23 golfers in that bucket this week where we normally see nine. And because it's an elevated event, we have all the good, uh, basically all the best golfers here. 50% of the stroke, uh, strength of field points go towards this. 100% uh, frequency rate of finding one of these guys inside the top 10. But guess what? Projection, we're projecting two to five. That's what also we get for your min max when it comes to top 10s. Zero to three optimal lineups. I don't think that really matters all that much because of the quality of golfer in this bucket. Now there are nine 9k and above golfers in the bucket and averages salary is $8,500. So I would go on the low side of this projection. If you're selecting golfers from this bucket, I'd select somewhere like two or three. And the wonderful thing about um, the cheat sheet, if you are on the cheat sheet,
go ahead and just sort A to Z from stroke chain bucket, and you'll have stroke chain one. This is how it's all sorted. That's how the color uh, scheme for the names and the, the buckets go by. It's by the stroke chain bucket. So stroke chain one out of these golfers. By the way, this is the cheat sheet, which you can find again in the description of the video. I'm gonna go back to my sheet. Um, two to five from this, this bucket here. Grayson Sig, $6,400 is your cheapest guy. Svensson is the only other guy in the 6K range. Either one of these guys, I don't mind playing. And quite frankly, all of the gol golfers in this bucket, I don't mind playing whatsoever. So two to five. I like Cantley, obviously. We were talking about, I was talking about that earlier. I, uh, I was also saying Sung J M and Ricky Fowler were golfers that I might build my lineups around. Well, guess what? If there are some of these guys down here that you want to fill your lineups with, Remember, it's two to five golfers from this bucket that I'm projecting to be inside the top 10. What's to say that if you selected five golfers, those aren't the ones that do finish inside the top 10 or have a good possibility of finishing inside the top 10. So keep that in mind. Stroke scheme two, zero to two is the projection. Victor Hovland is at the top of this one. Then Sam Burns, Keith Mitchell, and then it kind of just drops. Zero to two, I think is a perfect projection for this bucket. My guy, Adam Scott is here. Uh, I do like Adam Scott this week, by the way. Strokes gain three. Our projection here is one to three. We've seen a minimum of three every single year inside the top 10 and a minimum of two in the optimal lineup every single year. There are 47 of those golfers in this bucket. This year, we're on average, we see 36. So chances of this being closer to three golfers representing the top 10 is pretty high. Uh, and if there's ever any reason to really get on Justin Thomas, I mean, this is a perfect time to do so. Same goes with like Colin Morikawa. No issues there. Cam Young seems fine. Same with Corey Connors. I'm just, I probably never get to Shane Lowry, honestly. Siwoo Kim, I think is fine play. I don't mind going Riley, Davis, Buckley, Jaeger. Probably skip JJ Spawn and Joel Damon and Kitayama. Okay, so most of these guys I'd probably skip. I'm going to play all these guys sparingly, like, 4% or lower. I, I don't feel comfortable playing a lot of these guys. Pendrith, though, it, he's 36th in my model. I kind of like Pendrith this week. I think that's a pretty good value. $7,000? Yeah, I, I, I could be convinced to play Pendrith. So, again, this pro, uh, the bucket projection here, 1 to 3. So if you found 3 golfers you like, by all means, go ahead and play them. And then 0 to 2 for the rest of the buckets. So when I scroll down, when we have it sorted by the stroke chain stuff, this is zero to two, grab zero to two golfers here. So again, no more than two. If you're feeling frisky, go for it. Pick three or four. Sometimes the buckets are not successful, but if you're really trying to hit the optimal lineup, you want to follow the projections. So zero to two, um, if I was to pick a golf, like, I mean, Kuchar obviously stands out. I don't mind Denny McCarthy. JT Post and someone I don't mind playing at $7,100. I think that's fine. Same goes with Sam Ryder and maybe Seamus Power. Yeah, we'll see. Eric Cole, $6,800. Not terrible. I actually wouldn't mind going to Frankie Molinari, honestly. But probably just skip past the rest of these guys. You know, play the rest of these guys sparingly. Uh, and then 0 to 2, stroke chain 5. Webb Simpson is still in this bucket, which is sad. Guy has fallen far from grace. Eric Van Royen still down here. Um, that's crazy. That is that is uh, negative off the tee and negative putting stats. Is that true? Yeah, he's he's basically a zero off the tee guy, uh, but a really bad putter. I think recently he's probably been playing better, right? Oh, he's still negative off the tee. How? Doesn't the guy bomb the golf ball? Is he just that inaccurate? 298 is what his driving distance is. Okay, so I guess not. I thought he hit the ball way farther than that. He's a whole different golfer. I didn't even think. I, I thought he was better. Yeah, I thought he was better. Yeah, zero to two of these guys, by the way. This is a good reason not to play any of these golfers. And then we have one stroke scene six guy. So yeah, probably just stay away from his him as well. That covers all the buckets this week, though. And subsequently, that also covers the preview video, which right at our one hour and 45 minute mark uh, happens every single week. So let's go ahead and do some, uh, just some giveaway reminders, by the way. 
So I'm bring that down. We did run a monthly and a weekly subscriber giveaway earlier in the video. If you want to go check out who won, I mean, I can give it to you right now. It was Gabe. Gabe won both the monthly and the weekly giveaway. So congratulations, Gabe. You win a t-shirt as well as $5. But if you want to enter into the weekly giveaway that I do every Monday night, that also gets you into the monthly giveaway. They're, they're one and the same. It's just I obviously run the weekly giveaway weekly and the monthly giveaway monthly. <laughs> so if you want an entry, uh, an entry into this, be subscribed to the channel. Comment down below if you need any help with topics. Always give me your two favorite golfers that you want to build your lineups around. That's the simplest way to do it. You can leave whatever, whatever message you want. You will get credit for it as long as you're subscribed to the channel. And you get one free entry per video. So this is a preview video. I'm going to cut these all up into segments. Those segments will all be their standalone videos. So I think there's already going to be four plus this one. And then I have a strategy video I'm going to do tomorrow. So that'll be six plus the live version of itself. Seven. You have seven opportunities to get your name into the giveaway. Now, it's not so much opportunities. You will get an entry for every time that you participate. So you can get seven entries into next week's weekly giveaway which again is five free dollars just by participating on the channel. So that's available to you. And again, those weekly giveaways, uh, those entries go into the monthly giveaway. And if you're not on prize picks, this is available to you. Check out the link in the description. They'll send you to the prize picks homepage. Once you hit sign up, sweet spot will already be pro uh, populating the promo code. You sign up using that promo code, put some money in your account. I will give you $20 back. Plus, price picks will match your deposit up to $100. So if you want to put $20, $40, $60, $80, $100 in your account, they're just going to double it. And you're still going to get $20 back for me. So check out the link down below or go to price picks. Use the promo code SweetSpot when you sign up and put, put an initial deposit in there. And you'll get $20 back for me as soon as I get a report saying that you signed up using the promo code. So that is also available and hopefully you follow along with me with the cheat sheet and everything i will have an optimizer ready for tomorrow in the strategy video again i go live 7 p.m central standard time be there we'll build some lineups we'll go over anchor buckets we'll go over marquee tea times remember the mexico open 100 successful when it comes to the sweet spot process buckets were 100 the marquee tea times were 100 and obviously we go over the marquee tea times in the strategy video and again i build lineups using the optimizer so if you want to check it out again tomorrow 7 p.m central standard time that's all i have for you guys so thank you for watching please leave a like comment subscribe all that good stuff and i'll see you in the next one all right bye